start recording and say good afternoon. Welcome to the second in a series of panels sponsored by the Network for Undergraduate Research in Virginia, also known as NERVA, N-U-R-V-A. I'm Dr. David Solomon, Director of Undergraduate Research and Creative Activity at Christopher Newport University in Newport News. And it's my pleasure to introduce the second of three panels on the topic of remote and virtual research in the age of disruption. <clears throat> this panel highlights the STEM fields with three pairs of faculty student researchers from three Virginia universities. Before having each of them introduce themselves, I wanna invite you to the next panel on remote and virtual research in the age of disruption in the social sciences and business on Friday, November 20th in two weeks at noon. Um, watch for the flyer with the Zoom link, um, which you will also find at our website, which is nurvanerva.org. Today's session is being recorded and will be archived on that website. All participants are on mute. If you have specific questions for any of today's panelists, please uh, put them in the chat. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, moderator for today's panel, Dr. Kerry Swaby of Virginia Tech. Thank you, David. So welcome everybody. It is an extreme pleasure to be moderating today. Um, as David said, we're gonna um, start off with some introductions and then we'll get into a discussion. Um, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and I'll try and keep track. Um, so I think by way of introductions, maybe if we can go um, with the pairs by university. So if we could start with Christopher Newport. Hi, I'm Dr. Leslie Rollins. I'm an assistant professor of psychology and a member of the neuroscience faculty at CNU. Do you want any other information? Whatever you want to share to kick things off. Okay, so I can give maybe a brief synopsis of sure. my area of research. Sure. So I'm a developmental cognitive neuroscientist. My research focuses on memory, especially memory for details. And so part of my work examines how memory for details develops, um, especially during childhood. And then another big portion of my work is understanding the neural bases of memory as well. Wow. And Katie, as the student companion. <laughs> yes, my name is um, Catherine Goida. Um, I go by Katie. Um, my career here has been working with Dr. Rollins. Um, since freshman year and I'm currently a senior now. I will be graduating in December um, and I am majoring in neuroscience and I um, intend to obtain my master's degree in applied behavioral analysis post-graduation. Um, and yeah, is there anything else you wanted me to add or? That's fine, thank you. Um, and it, the pair from James Madison. So hi, I'm from James Madison. My name is Nate Wright and I'm in the chemistry and biochemistry department. Um, my work focuses on how cells sense and respond to physical stress and how they move. And this goes everywhere from through atomic resolution all the way to, uh, to cellular work. And my student is the one with the James Madison background, Kendall. She can tell you about herself. Hi, uh, as Dr. Wright said, my name is Kendall. I'm also from JMU and I work in his lab. Um, we were primarily a biochemistry, biophysical chemistry kind of based lab. My project specifically um, is focused around a protein called desmoplakin, which is important in your heart muscle cells. And um, my project really focuses on how certain mutations within this desmoplate or this protein can result in a heart condition called arrhythmic arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And I do a lot of wet lab experimentation and computational experimentation to really determine how these mutations are affecting just overall structure and function of the protein with these mutations. And she's going to graduate school next year, we hope. She just submitted yes. her applications yesterday. I submitted all of my applications last night. Ooh, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then last but not least, Virginia Tech team. 
lost my, <clears throat> hi, I'm Debbie Good. I'm um, here at Virginia Tech in the Department of Human Nutrition, Foods and Exercise. I'm also a uh, co-PI on an NIH funded summer research um, fellowship program that we call the Tour Scholars for Translational Obesity Undergraduate Research Scholars. Natasha was one of our Tour Scholars this summer, in fact. Um, and my research area is in the molecular genetics of body weight regulation, specifically looking at physical activity um, and also the condition Prader-Willi syndrome. Hi, I'm Natasha. I go to Virginia Tech. I'm a senior majoring in clinical neuroscience and psychology. Um, my project specifically with Dr. Good is looking at the heritability of obesity by looking at methylation patterns in the promoter region of various genes that are important in appetite and feeding. So we're looking to see uh, conserved regions in the promoter regions through different species and see how this affects heritability. Wow, okay, thank you all. <laughs> so I guess to kick things off and for the benefit of those with us who might not be, um, in STEM fields, um, can you tell us prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, how was your research routinely carried out in your area? And in what ways have you had to change? And you can go in any order, maybe the same way we did before. So we start with um, Christopher Newport. So prior to the pandemic, I would collect behavioral data in person from both adults as well as um, our child participants. And so everyone would be, you know, close quarters together uh, working on the computer. Um, the experimenter would um, follow the scripts and be engaging with the participant. I also do some research with eye tracking as well as EEG. And so EEG um, has been particularly difficult because that requires that you apply an EEG cap for about 15 minutes. And that's working directly with the person's head. So that is a line of research that we have chosen not to pursue this particular academic year. Um, but thankfully, we had just finished collecting data from our most recent EEG study right before our spring break. Um, in the spring, which is the week before um, we did transitioned online. So we've been working with that EEG data this semester. Um, so we've had to really shift pretty much every way that we do our research. Um, we've been able to continue the eye tracking work by maintaining physical distancing of six feet between the research assistant and the participant. So the research assistant will tell them how to adjust the height of the table and then give them the instructions from a physical distance. And then we've had to transition our child research from being in person using our specialized software to learning a new software online that allows us to lead our participants through the tasks and they can actually do it anytime that's convenient for them now. Um, and then Katie's been working on me with me on a systematic um, review of research on the own race bias in face recognition. And we were very fortunate that we had already planned this activity before her summer scholars experience. And so that's working with the articles and she can tell you a little bit more about what she's been doing, but that project navigated very well into um, this new COVID research environment. Yeah, um, so for that project specifically, what um, for Summer Scholars, it is a, I think it's a 10 week program where we are down at school conducting research, um, but this year it was held virtually. And so that transition was um, definitely interesting, but luckily my project didn't change as much. Um, so I was able to still conduct the same amount of research, um, but it's different because Dr. Rollins and I would normally be in-person meetings going over things, whereas now we're using Google Meet and having to share the screen or looking at the same spreadsheet um, and saying, oh, I'm in like cell like D6 and like having to navigate over there. So it's definitely been um, a little interesting to deal with like the in-person meetings and that aspect, um, but we've been able to adapt and keep going with it. JMU? Yes, sorry. Yes, I guess I'm next. Uh, so um, our research is sort of half split between uh, 
working on the computer and working in a wet lab. And the nice thing about chemistry and biochemistry is that we don't really deal with people. Matter of fact, a lot of people would say we don't like people. Um, it's not really true, but, but we don't have to, to be in somebody's face. Um, a lot of our work is bacterial based. We're really lucky that, um, and I think everybody here has, mo has seniors here. So a lot of this work is still being propelled by the inertia that, that we gained over the past three years. Um, so Kendall is, could do this essentially all on her own uh, without me being around at all. I feel that I need to be around sometimes to give her a hard time, but she's extremely, she's just a good student. She knows what she's doing. Um, I'm most worried about uh, the next crop. I'm not like trying to get sophomores and freshmen um, doing research is very difficult right now because they're either not on campus. So we meet once a week, you know, that um, they are on campus, but the rooms that we're in, we can't be in at the same time. So I will stand outside the cell culture room and FaceTime the person in the cell culture room and try to like say, okay, well, you know, put one milliliter of this into here or something like that because the room is too small. Um, but again, with Kindle's project, we happened to be at a place where we had collected a lot of data, a lot of wet lab data that Kindle then came back. We were closed down from like March to what, June something, Kindle? So she was not able to be in at all during that time, but we had time to think about the narrative of her project. And when she was able to get back into lab, which she has been able to do pretty regularly because as you see, she's wearing face masks. We have tape on the ground to denote six feet foot areas, um, you know, all the other safety things we do. Um, she was able to pretty nicely come in because she's so self-sufficient, do the work and we're now starting to write things up and that Again, we can just talk on, on Google Meet or whatever about that. And Kendall, do you have other things you want to point out about this? Um, I think you covered the basis pretty well. Yeah, being a, well, doing wet lab experiments requires you to be in lab, which is very difficult when the building is closed. But luckily, um, for the month of July, we were able to organize a standard, standard operating procedure that allowed me to come in and finish up some of the work as um, along with like doing some data analysis on um, work that I had done, I guess last fall slash spring before everything shut down. But um, yeah, for the most part, we've been able to resume uh, where we had left off and write a paper now. So that's great. <laughs> we're, we're trying to. We're... Yeah, we're trying. <laughs> that's exciting, Debbie. Okay. so. Um... Uh, our situation maybe is a little different. Normally in my lab, uh, we work in mice, we work in cell lines, we work in bacteria. Of course, an undergraduate doing research in my lab would be in the lab for the most part, and I would meet with them face to face. Um, in, in our situation, we were, uh, my, my colleague Samantha Harden and I were running a summer research program. We had actually matched all 10 of our students for that program with mentors. Um, and Natasha was matched with Dr. Timothy Jerome in animal science. And so um, not with me, <laughs> but as soon as we got the, and so this was all, this all was matching before the pandemic. Um, as soon as that, it was clear that we were going to be 100% online, what we had to do is come up with a way that students had an option to stay with the program rather than cancel the program. And so um, both Samantha and I ended up taking students who, uh, whose mentor maybe couldn't figure out what to do in terms of how to, how to do an online project. And so um, I had previously done um, an online project with a student who was in my nutritional genomics class who had graduated but still wanted to continue on something. Um, and we did that remotely for a year actually. <laughs> so, um, so I had this idea that we could do molecular genetic and silica work um, using a lot of the online tools and approach both Natasha's mentor as, as well as um, another student, Chloe, who is in my lab, um, to see, okay, do you have anything that we could start as a basis to sort of ask questions and work with um, and, and with um, both groups? Actually, it had very good interactions. And so it was really a co-project um, Natasha still continues as a co-project with Dr. Jerome. Um, he is still doing wet lab. And the, the hope for me is actually that we can start to move towards wet lab in the spring. That's kind of the goal for me. 
Um, we probably could have done it this at this point now. I mean, certainly I have people, graduate students working in the lab and, uh, but I don't have any undergraduates and we had to write a really huge justification for undergraduates working in the lab. So, um, but I think by spring things would have worked out where I think we can do it. So my hope is she'll move at that point. And would have collected a lot of data by then, which is a lot of data. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Good pretty much covered everything, but um, I think it was almost a benefit that I got to learn the in silico tools. That's something I would have never been able to learn had we been in person. So I think it's a really valuable experience that I was able to learn this from her. So in addition to hopefully going wet lab again someday, Corona actually benefited me a little bit hate to say that Corona benefited anything, but it was nice to be able to learn such an amazing tool that I'll be able to carry on with. Okay, so, so most of you, it sounds like um, kind of used for the most part data that was collected previously or able to be collected and kind of morphed into more of a data processing phase. Um, I'm curious how you see that progressing like if if we continue to have restrictions um where are the projects going to go are you able to shift to you know all online remote which i know traditionally you know when we think of stem we're thinking labs and obviously all of the activities you have have mentioned so is there any idea of shifts other shifts so I mentioned that with my child study that we decided to take that one fully online. Um, up until that point, I had been using an ePrime software that allows me to show stimuli randomly and has excellent experimental control. And there's really been an increase in web-based platforms that you can use for those same types of functions. And so with that type of work, if I didn't collect any more data, we just would have, I mean, that project wouldn't have gone, gone anywhere at all. Um, so what we've done is now we've transferred our entire study into this web-based platform called Gorilla, and we've been able to collect, actually we collected all of our undergraduate students from CNU within a week, um, which is amazing. Usually, even with our undergraduates, it would take a semester to collect 45 participants, and they, they did it online in no time. So similar to Natasha's comment, I hate to make a comment about COVID being beneficial to anything, but I very well might not do another purely behavioral study in person mm -hmm. since I can do it just as easily um, online and collect the data a lot faster. Silver lining is important. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, how did the kids respond? Because you said that this was a child study. I mean, doing things online, was that difficult or did that have added complications? So it seems like it's going pretty well so far. Um, we have, we're trying to recruit four and six year old children. And so the task takes the parents and the child about 20 minutes total. Um, the parent reads through the consent form and then the parent reads the instructions to the child that they're seeing on the computer screen. And then the child completes the task in about five to 10 minutes. And so, so far parents and the children are responding very positively. I think it's been helpful that they can do the task on their own time whenever it's convenient for them. So if they wake up the morning of the study that they plan to do it and the kid's in a bad mood, they can wait until the next day <laughs> until it's more convenient. So I think that's also been a major benefit. Fair enough, okay. Any other thoughts on, on not just data analysis, but collecting and how that will proceed? You know, I, I, I guess I'd add, it's, it's sort of a little downer, but I think that there is a limit on how much we could really do in silico. And so I really feel like in, in my in my case and Natasha's case, um, she's learned a lot for sure. Um, she's an expert in this area, but for her to get that benefit of being in a wet lab is just an entirely different experience. And there's no way that I could, that we could do the types of experiments we need to do that I can think of right now in mice and in cell lines. and the bacterial mutagenesis assays, you know, to make the plasma she needs without her being online, or sorry, in person, not online. Um, I think it was K 
Kendall, or maybe as Catherine who mentioned, just the in-person meetings. There is something better about an in-person meeting, especially when we're looking at these large promoters. And you know, Natasha and I are trying to zoom in and make sure we're looking at the right size. So again, um, you know, I'm hoping that we. I think we 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 switched gears well, but um, you know, short of just doing a new set of data or in, with a new, maybe other faculty men mentor. Um, at, at this point, we're probably gonna have to go to the lab after we, after we complete this semester. I don't see how further. Yeah, so, so to, echo, to echo what, De Debbie, Deborah? Okay. Uh, Deb, Deb, you know, Debbie, Deborah, okay. Debbie, whatever. Okay. Yeah, th there's, so, so, but since our work is a mixture of, of sort of molecular dynamics or in silico stuff and wet lab stuff, like we definitely could get ahead in the molecular dynamic stuff, which is good because like, it just, it takes time to run stuff. We have our big computers, but they still just take time. And this gave us some time to do stuff. But um, at least in our field, my, my general feeling is that if, if you present in silico stuff with no experimental evidence backing it up, it's basically just made up data. So you've got to you've got to do both sides of the coin. You have to get into lab. Um, and again, we were lucky that we had some some inertia going forward. But um, like I was in on a on an NSF panel about a month ago, and that the NSF realizes that things are just they're just going to be slow. Um, and that's not just for undergraduates. That's for, that's for everybody. They don't expect people to be publishing much right now because you know, what can you do? I think if you can find, you know, th there's a limited number of projects that, that people can push to completion. People have mentioned some positives. Another positive is simply slowing down, you know, being thoughtful about the experiments and about your, your conclusions is, a, um, is something that we've been able to do now that a lot of times in the, the fr freneticness of life, you just sort of, you don't have the time for. So that's been sort of a, a very slight silver lining. It's allowed us to um, stop focusing on the minutiae and start seeing the forest through the trees. Um, but it also has a limited um, limited number of cases where at some point we're gonna run out of data. Like we're simply gonna have to get in the lab and do stuff. And again, we've been lucky um, that we have uh, a group of people that are very into like, for Kindle, for instance, his, um, being a senior helps because she doesn't want to spend a lot of time with her mom anymore. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, these things, this is not something that would have happened to sophomores, right? They, they, so having, having older students helps because they want to be home. Sorry, Kendall, if I made you laugh or embarrassed. Are you going to unmute yourself or are you just going to stay muted? No, I mean, I was I gonna say we have we have Kendall's mother right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kendall's mom is great, but yeah, you know, no. at some point in it's senior year, you start thinking anyway. Being independent is definitely a good thing. <laughs> so, not that I don't like being at home, but. <laughs> But Nathan, but, you know, it's a good point you're bringing up about, you know, a lot of our students did go home, right? So they're not even in the area where they can do research. Natasha's still here in Blacksburg. I think you're still planning to be here in the spring. Um, but, you know, I, I, my niece is a tech student. She went home. I know a lot of students just didn't even stay in Blacksburg. So that really hurts in terms of trying to get students in the lab. Um, yeah, I, I think we got more than anything else. We got lucky. Like, I don't. I'm relatively young. I still think of myself as relatively young, and so I'm willing to come into lab with a mask and precautions and all. Kendall was willing to come back to lab, and that's not. That has nothing to do with planning. We just plain old got lucky. Well, let me follow up on that. Do you have ideas or have you thought about um, how to offer research opportunities for those students who are at home and who are remote and, and not able to physically come in to the lab? Well, okay, since nobody's talking, I'll go. Uh, this has been a good time to start new research projects. So I've been able to, to hook up with some sophomores and freshmen and say, listen, we want to study how, like Kindle studying mutations of the, in the heart. Of, and it's like, well, there's also mutations in skin. Uh, same protein, different disease, 
So I've been able to say, okay, guys, why don't you go like search through all the databases, come up with all the mutations you can find. This is a really good opportunity to start learning how to use these databases as a sophomore. It's going to take, it would take, you know, experienced students a couple hours. It's going to take sophomores days to weeks to come up with this stuff. Um, on the other hand, they're doing it, they have to do it themselves. So it's been a good time to sort of start some groundwork on, on new projects that aren't really ready for prime time yet, but are, you know, they're, they're good ways to get students into the process of looking up um, background data and start sort of forming in their own minds what they can do. I think that's a good point. I also liked your point about just slowing down a little bit. Um, one thing that we did in my lab this summer was that we submitted a registered report, which is where you submit essentially a research proposal to a to a journal, and they evaluate it under peer review um, with two or three reviewers, where they evaluate the solidness of the science that you've proposed, and then it can be accepted in principle. So that when you complete the project as you proposed, it will be accepted as long as you're not drawing invalid conclusions based on the data that you actually have. And so I think that whole slowing down that you mentioned, normally we just, we collect the data, then we analyze the data and then we go back and we write it up, but COVID kind of forced us to slow down. And so we had the opportunity to engage in this kind of earlier stage of writing. I mean, I guess I'll just add that uh, Natasha and I have already talked about publishing her work in silico. I mean, Nathan's right. It's a little bit harder because there is no hard data. Um, and my thought had been that she would initially submit to an undergraduate research journal. Um, and then we would, we would with, um, um, you know, our, our colleagues um, lab skills as well. So she probably would work in both of our labs, work together with us and then have the actual wet lab data. Um, and I, I don't think that the undergraduate journal uh, publications negate being able to, which, which really would be the proof of principle, similar to what Leslie's talking about, would, would negate us being able to publish the actual wet lab studies in a journal. So that's kind of the plan for us. So thinking about the, um, the students who are actually physically able to participate, um, and you've kind of mentioned some of this as we've been talking, what are the actual like logistical constraints? Because Nate mentioned being outside the door, talking through FaceTime or, or whatever. So can you give an idea, students as well, um, some of the things that you've had to change the way that you operate? So being the senior on my project, I will be graduating in May. And so um, in my lab, we just had to find somebody to take over the project who I have been training. Um, training a new lab student kind of looks different because with some of the techniques that I use, you kind of have to like show them relatively close. Cause I'm like, if there's like an instrument, like I have to be next to the instrument as well as to show her like, this is how you use a sonicator. So it's kind of like taking a step back and trying to be more, I don't know, just like explaining things better, but like not doing it for them. It's, it's just kind of difficult, you know, because we can't be in the same space for a certain, like for long periods of time. Um, so that's definitely one of the things that I would say is a little bit different um, in the lab. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Kendall, what else did you have problems with yourself? So that was training people, but you also had to deal with all sorts of things starting back. Oh, right. Yeah. So being out of the lab uh, for a while, um, I've found that it's a little bit harder to get things running again. I run into more problems. Um, one of the bigger problems I had was just getting my protein to express for some reason. Um, yeah, I had to mess around with like the growth and induction conditions to see uh, what it preferred, like the temperature and like growth time and just like the purification process as well. I had to change some things up. Um, so it's just like little stuff like that too, just to get the ball rolling again. Natasha or Katie, do you want to add anything? 
Um, not not directly related to Natasha's project, but um, when all of this happened in March, we were sort of informed that we should reduce our mouse colonies and those sorts of things so that we can kind of slow down everything. You know, in hindsight, I don't really think we had to do that, but I did. Um, and then for my graduate student, that really that did impact his ability to work because it took it took a lot more time then to get back our mouse colony to the level where we are getting the type of um, genetic backgrounds that we needed. But yeah, no, I have, he already knew what to do, um, but it's this kind of trail of people, of trainers, you know, so I, that, that I think I'm really going to miss uh, that I'm going to be the one doing most of the training, which is fine. I'm still very active in the lab. It's not a problem, but um, time-wise is what I'm worried about because I'm sure that the other three faculty, four or five faculty on this meeting could, could uh, you know, commiserate. And the Journal of the Chronicle of Higher Education today had an article, if you want to go check that out, on just, you know, professor burnout right now. It's just crazy, right? Because you're trying to juggle so many things. And I'm definitely taking over more lab things these days. So I have somebody's entire project, um, for example, where I'm doing all of the mouse work for it. That's huge. <laughs> yeah, piggy, piggybacking off what Dev said, one thing that I've been sort of worried about in general is maintaining lab culture. Like I, I really like the, the, the vibe in our lab. It's, it's a fun place to be. And that's how you get undergrads in the research lab is it's you don't make it a slave driver sort of thing. You have fun, you hang out. It's a place to both do work and to for professors and students to talk together. But that's really, I, lab culture is fragile and and especially as people start graduating i'm really concerned about the ability to maintain good uh healthy lab dynamics and in, in like not so much this year but next year and the year after yeah definitely continuing with that point um i know something that especially with my project you know you talk about excuse me undergraduate research and um you think, oh, working in a lab, working on different petri dishes or cells. Whereas for my project, I'm sitting at my computer reading through hundreds and hundreds of articles, pulling the data from it, analyzing the results. And then like, it's a, it's a bunch of computer work, which um, for some students might not seem as enticing. And so it's finding individuals who, after I leave in December, will want to continue the project, even though like I'm, I will still work on some of it, but it's gonna be, who's gonna take over the brunt of it after I leave um, is something. And I'm sure Dr. Rollins could also comment on that where we talk about the project and some individuals may seem interested and then they look at the work and it's a little bit different than what they expected. So also setting expectations of doing the work and continuing on a project even after the fact. Yeah, this project has that Katie's been working on has definitely been harder to sell <laughs> than some of the other ones because with other projects like EEG, I'm like, you get to record brain activity or you're going to record their eye movements. That's a little more, I think, enticing than you're going to be doing the systematic review or you're going to go through the article, write down the year it was published, who the authors were, what kind of stimuli they use in very fine grained detail. And I mean, Katie and I started off with, what was your list? 10,000 articles first when you generated it from the search. And then we pared it down to 759 abstracts we went through. And then we got down to 250 that were going through in some granular detail. So it's, it's a very demanding project. And it's even harder, I think, in this more isolating situation where normally Katie and I would meet and that would be a little more personal even though she's doing the computer work but now it's all computer work all the time. And, and I think this leads to an, another area <laughs> to explore is how because you mentioned lab culture and and you're talking about meetings and coming together how how have you maintained that connectivity the the mentoring aspects you know or even connecting with other people in the lab. Have you found anything to be particularly effective or do you have any ideas to share? What have you done? Hey, Kendall, who do you live with? I live with a, another student in our lab. Um, I live with all chemistry majors. <laughs> so, and they're also all in their own research lab. 
So that's kind of fun. <laughs> You're all doing research, so you all commiserate and. <laughs> Exactly. Yep. That's yeah. Exactly. And next door is another person. And so, so part of it is that they, at least at JMU, they sort of like, like self select into these little groups and they live off campus on their own, their own little chemistry apartments. So, um, again, it, it's just luck of the draw that this happened to ha this happened to occur this year. But yeah, I mean, that gives them that so called social pod, right? Where they're not getting exposed to other people. So, I'm sure that's a benefit. Um, I don't yeah. have anything other than a Zoom meeting you know, to offer. It's, well, one thing that we've had luck with is, so all my students have my cell phone number, which there's always that worry that like, there's going to be some privacy barrier bro broken. But it, it, it's kind of fun. Like, Kendall and I have definitely been on conference calls or FaceTime at like 10 o'clock on a Saturday night before. It's like, Kendall, don't you have better things to do than talk to your professor right now? Uh, but it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's been a, like, uh, it's, it's been nice to just be able to, like, have these, like, random, who is that, have these random conversations uh, with, with students that sometimes involve science, but sometimes are like, like, Kendall last night, it's like, I finished all my applications, like, good job, Kendall, <laughs> just, you know, and, and just other like we just I get random phone calls like especially this week there's been all sorts of phone calls and text threads about the election which is obviously not a whole lot to do with with the science that we're doing but is something that's on everyone's mind and that to be able to be more uh, available and accessible to students and to not just be a research advisor but to be somebody to, to like bounce other ideas off of or complain about something or whatever I think has been helpful or has it just been annoying Kendall? For the most part it's been helpful. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Good response. <laughs> um, and, and likewise with mentoring um, and I guess it kind of piggybacks on, on what you were just talking about. Have you, has mentoring taken a hit? Like how, how are, are you working directly with students? Because as you said Debbie, Zoom, I mean there's only so much you can do on Zoom and you know, with these windows <laughs> and, and really understanding and relating to people. So uh, mentoring wise, how, how have you changed and students, what has resonated with you? Have there been things that have worked particularly well or not? I mean, we, we are still meeting by Zoom um and but i mean we talk about things other than just the science so i mean there's definitely some personal discussions going on natasha hasn't met anyone in my lab yet though personally i've never i've never seen you in person except for once right <laughs> since we we met um you know over the summer so it's sort of yeah just once at when you came to ilsb that's the only time i've seen her in person like standing up um, so, so it's definitely a different situation, but I feel like we have a good rapport. I feel like we could just pick it up again when we go into the lab. So I, I mean, I could be totally wrong, but um, I love the idea of sort of a group chat. Um, we definitely did that when um, in the spring, more with the group that I had there in the spring, but they've mostly gone by now, except for one. Um, but I think that's a great way to sort of keep everyone together. So I appreciate that Nathan said that. I don't know if Natasha wants to talk about any tip. Well, you learned a new piece of software. Um, the OneNote, like OneNote works really well for digital lab books. Mm -hmm. I've definitely learned a lot of like digital communication tools through all of this. Um, when we first started doing research together, I was in the Tor Scholar program, so there was a lot of other scholars, and we were meeting once a week as a full group, rather than like direct meetings between me and Dr. Good. And now that we're in the semester, I'm meeting with her individually on a weekly basis, which I found was way more beneficial. I was kind of having the issue over the summer where I would like think that the research that I had gotten or the data that I had collected wasn't enough to reach out or it wasn't significant enough of a question to ask and I didn't want to like be a bother but now that we're meeting on a weekly basis it's like a full hour where you can discuss anything no question is too small and it's 
really opened up the conversation, I feel like. So I think that's been really beneficial. Like she said, we haven't met in person more than once, but at least I know that every single week we have that Zoom. So I'm never feeling like I'm drowning in the digital world. Kind of opposite of that, um, Dr. Rollins and I have known each other since my freshman year. So four years ago, three years ago now. Um, and so we, I've worked with her. I and we've kind of like built this connection where when we go into meetings, we kind of know what we need to do and like we can read each other and stuff. Um, so switching from that to online, it was, I feel like it was a little bit difficult at first because it was like, okay, like we, how do we know when like the other person's talking? Whereas before that in person contact, you can see those things. Um, and so it's definitely not the way I would have envisioned ending my senior year during research, but you know, you have to deal with what you're drawn. And so um, I think we've been able to really do that. But I think having that foundation of that connection beforehand really helped with like our project and still being interested in it. Cause I feel like if I didn't have that, I could become very disinterested and not want to do the project anymore. Okay. And another shift I think you experienced too, Catherine, was going from kind of you would initially worked with like a group. And I think we tend to have like small group meetings where it's like me and two or three other RAs and we, we meet weekly um, together. And then with your project, it was really for a while, it was just you. We've added on a few new RAs since then. Um, but those group meetings have happened a little bit less than we had been doing before. So some of you have, have mentioned this, and so I just wanted to follow up on that. How do you recruit new students? I mean, how how do we entice them? How you know, because the the three students on the call are seniors, and you know, have some experience. But I don't know. Do you have advice for freshmen, sophomores who are thinking about starting research in this strange world? And likewise, faculty. How do you get them involved and started? So at least here, um, we've spent a lot of time, we, the chemistry department has spent a lot of time like talking up research for years and years. It's like what we do is that's what we're, I mean, I think it's the best part of, of, of James Madison chemistry is the, the prospect of being able to do research. So the older students, if they can, can talk to the younger students, but mostly it happens in like gen chem lab or organic lab. And like, I can remember a couple of weeks ago, I made that stupid little video on my phone. Like, like yeah. our Gen Chem lab, like they're like, okay, record some, record you showing around yourself around lab. So I just recorded like a three minute thing on my phone. It's like, you know, this is this stuff. And here's, here's some, here's a student or two that's are nice and socially distanced. And, you know, it, it was like, at least they had some, uh, some exposure to the fact that I exist. Um, I was able to get two, two sophomores this year. And again, the sophomores have the, that's about when we want people to start because freshman year, a lot of freshman year is just getting used to the college experience. Um, in sophomore year, they're, you know, they're sort of ready uh, in, in a good mental space to start uh, research. And so I was able to get two this year, uh, one of whom is on campus, one of whom is not. And the one not on campus has actually been quite uh, easy to mentor them and to get them in because Zoom calls are much less scary than showing up at a professor's office. Uh, so the, the activation barrier has been lower. And so we've been able to have good conversations. And if she doesn't show up, you know, I'd leave Zoom on for 15 minutes and then say, oh, you obviously weren't there. Let's try to meet tomorrow. And so it becomes less of a big deal for like, it, it just, it makes things a little less formal. Similar to your comment, we have also a very good culture of engaging students in undergraduate research. And each year I have so many students reach out um, that it's it can almost be challenging to, you want to give them opportunities, but also you don't want your lab to be too large because then your own, you know, you can only spread your time um, so far. So I think I've added six new students to my research this semester. Um, and so recruitment has not been particularly um, impacted. A lot of times students have the same question of what we're talking about today. So are you doing research? 
how are you doing research? And I was like, well, that sounds, that's a great question. Sign up for a meeting. We can talk about what we're doing and how we've adapted. Okay, so kind of flipping the switch because we've talked about challenges. So I'm curious, have you discovered anything surprisingly positive? I know there were a couple of, of don't want to say thank you to COVID, but are there any things that have surprised you that you've learned or benefited from or things that you think will continue after COVID-19 that maybe you didn't consider before? I know, Leslie, you talked about new software and stuff like that, but anything that, that has surprised you that, that will continue when we go back to normal? I mean, for me, because of the fact we had these students who maybe wouldn't have a project if, if we hadn't have sort of rethought the project. Um, I now have two new collaboration collaborators at Virginia Tech. And so because I had sort of that in silico molecular genetics background and they had the data set, now we're collaborating in a way. I think that's a, definitely a benefit that wouldn't have happened otherwise, for sure. Um, yeah. Yo, I'll echo what Deb said we've had um, much stronger collaborations form. Like we had sort of a loose network of collaborators, of collaborators, but now we have like, you know, Zoom meetings every two weeks and talking about like, it's, it's, it's become a, like a real thing because people are reaching out because they, they don't have the resources they need. And so all of a sudden there, it, it's like, yeah, the collaborator strength is much greater than it used to be. Yes, go ahead. I want to hear from the students. I'm curious if there's anything you think you will carry through. I definitely enjoy having the lab cleaned more often. Um, sometimes it got kind of gross. So that's definitely a plus, I would say. <laughs> Natasha or Katie, do you have anything that you think you'll hold on to or think it will be a positive coming out after this? Yeah, I definitely think the um, idea that research can also be conducted anywhere, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a lab, um, and how I'm still able to conduct um, research and um, intensive research by sitting on my bed while I'm coding the things or at like a Starbucks or something. So it's, there's a lot of different types of research that um, I feel like undergrads might not be exposed to. And so taking that with me and being like, well, you could also do this project if you wanted to. We, we have a question in the chat. Um, and this is directed towards the faculty and the students. We've heard some wonderful benefits of our current environment and several challenges associated with research in STEM. How might your institution better support each of you during the current pandemic and in the future? given the changed pace of research work. So what might the institutions do to support what you're doing? I was thankful that I had access to some professional development funds in order to, because the new um, web-based platform that I'm using for data collection does cost about a dollar per participant. And so I needed to have some sort of funding in order to collect data in that format. So I was thankful that I was able to use some of my professional development funds for that purpose. And Susan Sumner was on, she's our um, academic programs dean in uh, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. And, um, you know, immediately when all of this happened, she set up a group that talked about online teaching and learning and actually there was money available through the university uh, to basically help a lot of people transition in different ways from labs large classes Carrie was involved in this as well from a university provost side of things so you might want to talk about that as well but I feel like there's definitely an understanding I am a little bit worried for our junior faculty who are not tenured yet um, to be frank, I did sit on p and this year and nothing was really said. And so maybe this year isn't the impact. Um, I'm a little bit worried down the line when people are coming up and there's this year of COVID, but I have heard that there is potentially a way to, I don't know if it's formalized yet, to basically stop the clock due to this um, for people that felt they were very impacted. And um, I know I would be very supportive of that because um, like all the other faculty have said, you definitely have slow, like I wrote five papers in the beginning of the year. 
and nothing sense and I'm a little even worried about myself getting a lot more out so yeah I, I think that the hope hopefully the universities realize that they need to be be kind uh, and that involves with faculty especially junior faculty they need to pause the tenure clock or wait um, at least in our department that's already happened and with in the in the department um, the university has been okay been fine with it. Um, for students, um, what they really need is, I'm, I'm starting to get worried about access. Like the reason that I was able to get Kindle back is I was able to somehow lure her away from uh, working at Target uh, because she needed a summer job. She, so if I hadn't had money, she couldn't have come back. I happen to have external grants, but there needs to be some funding for people. Like, you can't expect college students to, to do this stuff even on their bed where they could otherwise be working somewhere else over the summer, just picking up a random summer job. You've got to give, you've got to have funding uh, to, to pay the students because that's how you get a diverse set of, of students coming through your lab. So I'm curious for the students that are on the call, um, you know, other than the funding issue and paying you, um, are there other things that our institutions can do to support what you're going through at the moment, which is incredibly unusual and extraordinarily stressful? I guess not. We're doing every we're doing a great job, folks. Oh, come on, guys. If there was now, one thing I, I'm going to I'm going to speak for some of the students only in the fact that I'm thinking as a person who will be looking for graduate students, I think we're going to have to as faculty really think about students access to research and maybe not expect a student who is applying to be in a PhD program to always have as much research experience as we have in the past. Um, so I hope that universities, I mean, I hope that people will realize that. I mean, we're all going, it's not like an isolated thing. We're all going through it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that pe not everyone has had this opportunity to do some sort of online remote project. And so we're going to have to realize that students did not necessarily have the access. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure how to make that a policy per se, or if it needs to be, but to me, that's something that has to be really emphasized in upcoming graduate applications. Well, speaking from an entire outsider perspective, not ever having sat on any sort of graduate school, anything, because JMU doesn't do that. Um, I, my hope is that simply having conversations like this with, with other professionals, like we have this conversation again, a couple of months ago, I was, at the NSF and people are having very similar conversations. A lot, I mean, there are a lot of thoughtful people out there. And the question is, you know, as long as they make their voices heard and, and you know, recognize that the situation's weird right now, I, I think it, it has a chance of really working out, but I think it's really needs, it's incumbent on the faculty to speak up and say, hey, you know, you need to consider this. I think they're doing that. But again, I'm not on these committees, so I can't I just sort of, this is what I get from sort of secondhand and hearsay information. Well, I think I'm going to wrap us up here because we're coming to close to the end of our hour. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, there is a link to a survey in the chat. Really appreciate it if you would click on that and just fill out that quick three question survey. I want to especially thank our wonderful panel of faculty and students from Virginia Tech, JMU, and CNU. Um, Thanks, tremendous thanks to Dr. Carrie Swaby at Virginia Tech for her moderating. Um, we got to work on that Southern drawl um, that, that she has. You know, it's, it's Southern Canadian, but we're, 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 we've got to work on that. Um, something about that's got to, got to, got to, got to shift. Um, please join us again in two weeks on fr Friday, November 20th at noon for remote and virtual research in the age of disruption in social sciences and the business fields and enjoy the rest of your day and the upcoming weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thanks, David.